Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a restful weekend, long weekend. Um, and today we're going to start on lecture three, which is going to be about cells. Um, so please remind, remember there is a quiz today that you have to do online. Uh, the quiz is available until 11.59 tonight. Um, so please be sure to complete that before the deadline. Um, all right, let's get to it. So lecture three is about cells, um, and uh, uh, we're just going to start with a brief introduction um, about the topic. When we, uh, okay, there's a question. We do, yeah, you don't need to have a printer for quiz. Okay, everything is done online. Okay? You don't need to print anything at all. So in the first lecture, we talked about the um, organization of life, right? How we um, have the smallest building blocks as atoms, and then they come together to form uh, molecules. Yes, there's a question, Tosh, go ahead. You have your hand up, Tosh? Sorry, Professor. Um, so I actually had a, a question regarding the test. Sure. Um, so in your like part two and part three of uh, lecture two, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned like many different things um, uh, for, for the macromolecules, uh, like polysaccharides, disaccharides, monomers, mm -hmm. uh, complex carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So um, should we know like every single thing that you uh, mentioned about these or is there like specific things that we should focus on uh, and have memorized? So everything uh, in the uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, in the lecture recordings, and the study guides, those are uh, things that you should know for the for the quiz uh, and and for tests for that matter. Okay, um, I mean in in terms of uh, how to prepare for it, right? Like make sure you go through your study guides and know how to do those questions. Now, um, it's it's okay for you guys to have um, like a, like a help sheet when you do the quiz. Um, that that's not cheating. Okay, so like if there's you found that there's too much information and you can memorize all of it, then you know summarize some of the you know things that you have trouble memorizing and and have a help sheet available during the quiz. Um, that might um, you know that might be useful. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, so basically, like if we're able to answer the study guide, like the entire study guide, will will be okay the test or <laughs> i i don't i i cannot you know that that's should you should be in a good spot okay, okay. Uh, but like i said there are application questions right like there will be questions where you see it and and you're like oh we didn't talk about this in class but you you have to apply your knowledge right to 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 answer them okay I but understand. it shouldn't shouldn't be too difficult yeah thank you so much okay no problem all right so as i was saying um you know the molecules can can be small like h2o uh and and you know it could be could be big right like um macromolecules the ones that we uh we talked about uh in, in lecture two right the the carbohydrates the polypeptide and so on and so forth right so so now we are moving uh up the ladder once again you know, we're going to be talking about uh, organelles which are uh, small structures that are found within the cell and they are vital for the um functioning of the cell okay so different organelles they're like mini organs different organelles will have different um uh, function um as we'll learn them uh, momentarily and then you know we, we're gonna be looking at the cells as a whole, we will be studying animal cells specifically, as well as uh, plant cells. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, okay, you have uh, uh, like an adult that's a little bit more than one meter. Um, and then if you think about an egg, that's about one centimeter, right? So, uh, Oh, actually, not not one centimeter, like a little bit bigger than you know two three centimeters, I would say. Um, and then if you keep on going smaller and smaller, right, the animal cells and and plant cells they are roughly in this range between ten micrometers and one hundred micrometer. For those of you who don't know, um, one meter has ten to the six micrometer. 
Okay, so this is uh, a millionth of a meter. Okay? So very, very small. You are not going to be able to see it uh, with the naked eye, and, and you will need to have microscope to, uh, to be able to see the animal cells and the plant cells. Um, bacteria are even smaller. They are about the size of uh, some of the organelles that we'll be learning. And then viruses are even smaller, right? And then when we get to the molecular level, uh, we have the proteins, our lipids. Those are in the uh, almost in the nanometer uh, uh, range. Okay, so one meter is ten to the nine nanometers. So a billionth of a meter. That's what a nanometer is. Okay, so we will be focusing on this range here um, when we when we talk about the animal cells and the plant cells. So what is a cell? A cell is, by definition, the smallest unit that has the properties of life. So we, you know, we talk about various properties of living things, right? Um, the uh, there is a structure, order associated with it. Um, the requirement of energy, right? Um, maintaining homeostasis, all those things, all those characteristics, will still exist at the cellular level. So the smallest unit that has all those things, that's what we call, um, that's what we define as a cell. Now, different cells have different shapes and different uh, um, uh, uh, size, but they all retain the properties of life. So over here, uh, anybody know what this picture is showing here? Just like wild guess, something in our body. Blood cells. I mean, brains. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Neurons. Neurons. That's right. Neuron is correct. Yeah. Good try with the with the blood cell though. Okay. So this is these are neurons. And you can see they're making connections with each other, right? Um, this is an amoeba, right? Which is single cell organism that are found in ponds. Uh, sometimes they make their way in swimming into swimming pools, and then it gets you know, people sick, um, you know, you may get like diarrhea from uh, from having the amoeba in your system. Uh, over here, we have some uh, streptococci, which is bacteria that could cause infection in humans. So these are all individual cells and all of them has the property uh, of life that we've talked about. Now, even though the cells look very different, right? the neuron looks very different from the amoeba, which looks very different from the bacteria, but they all share three common features. Okay? The following three things are always found in all cells. So they have a cell membrane, right, which separates the living environment on the inside from the non-living environment. Sometimes the cell membrane is also called a plasma membrane, right? they mean the same thing. All cells have genetic materials, genetic materials. So sometimes they are in the form of DNA, sometimes they are also found in the form of RNA as well. So these genetic material gives the cell identity and they are going to pass these genetic material on to the next generation when the cell divides. And then they all have Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the liquid portion of the cell um, on the inside. Okay? Liquid portion of the cell um, inside the cell membrane. Okay? Some cells have a nucleus, which is a central area in the middle that contains the genetic material, but this is not a common feature. Okay, only a cell membrane, genetic material, and cytoplasm are the common. Uh, features of all cells. Now, there is something called the cell theory. Um, there are four generalizations in the, uh, in the cell theory. Um, people didn't always know about the existence of, um, of cells, right? It wasn't discovered until, um, you know, the microscope was invented, right? And we're going to get to that later. But um, in terms of you know, once they discover cells, there are four things that they found to be consistent right, with these cells. Number one, every living organism consists of one or more cells. Right, so here is a single cell organism, much like amoeba 
this paramecium is a pond dwelling uh, organism. It lives in ponds, stream water, right? It's, uh, 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 just uh, like freshwater dwelling uh, organism. Okay, and it's a single cell, right? Um, uh, 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 just by itself, right? It has these little hairs that helps it swim around. Um, and you can see, okay, there is a, 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 a bit of a cell structure on the inside. So, you know, it, it's just on its own, happy as it can be. Some organism uh, is about thousands of cells. So this is a, what's called a C. elegans. Right? It's one of the few model organisms that are used for doing a lot of research um, on, on human biology. Okay? Mouse is another one. Uh, fruit flies is another one. C. elegans is one of them. Um, they are very easy to grow, very easy to um, to breed. So that's why it makes them an ideal organism. And then transparent, so we can see what's going on inside them. So this thing is about 3,000 cell big. Uh, and when it comes to humans, we are talking about trillions of cells, right? So, you know, regardless of how many cells you're made up of, the key thing here to know is all living things are going to have cells in them. Second part of the cell theory is that a cell is the smallest unit of life, individually alive, even as part of a multicellular organism, okay? So um, you actually can take a cell out of your body and if you feed it with nutrients, it's able to grow on its own without you, without the, the, the entire organism. So, you know, on the individual level, they are alive. Yeah. But, you know, you, you need to take care of them. Like you can't just like take the cell out and, you know, leave it on the desk, right? That they will dry up and die for sure. But if you, you know, give it some nutrients, that's what these red uh, solutions are, right? They are able to uh, thrive in the environment. Sometimes they might even divide and grow a little bit, okay? So um, there is something called HeLa cells, okay? HeLa cells. Um, there was this lady who uh, in, in, in 1952, uh, her name is actually uh, Harrietta uh, Lacks, and she had uh, cervical cancer, right? So what happened was uh, the doctor took a little bit of a biopsy sample from her, uh, uh, from her tumor, and uh, you know they were studying it on the, um, in, in the lab, and they leave it in a Petri dish. And, and what they've discovered was that the cancer cell was able to keep on dividing and dividing and dividing, right? It's dividing endlessly in the, in the lab. Um, and, and that's how they created the first, what we call a human cell line. Uh, oops, let me write that down for you. Human cell line. So these are HeLa cells. Um, and a cell line is basically uh, uh, um, usually derived from a human source and you are able to keep on growing them in a, in a Petri dish, okay? So uh, you can buy healer cells from pharmaceutical company to do, to do research, but it originates from, uh, from, from this person. Um, and since the discovery of healer cells, you know, they, they were able to do uh, studies on various biological processes. Um, so things like the uh, polio vaccine, uh, tuberculosis, Ebola, HIV, cancer treatment, all these things were done uh, on, on, on HeLa cells, okay? So the contribution is, is tremendous. But the problem was um, they never got the consent from, uh, from the patient to use her cells to mass produce these cell lines, okay? And actually um, her family uh, was recently suing the company, Thermo Fisher, uh, for, um, for using, you know, uh, their family members' cells to basically, um, uh, make money off it, right? Because they're selling these cell lines, right? Um, and so there was a lawsuit that was going on. I, I didn't really look into what was the outcome of it. Um, this was like two years ago. So maybe a verdict was, um, uh, has, has been reached, uh, but that's something for you to, uh, to look into. So number one is that all living things are made up of, uh, of cells, one or more cells. And number two is that the cells themselves are alive even without the entire organism. 
And the next part is all living cells come from division of pre-existing cell. Or to get more cells, you must start with one cell. The cell can split, and then you now have two cells. And if those two new cells split again, then you have four. Every time the cell splits, you know, you get more and more cells. In, um, in the body, though, cells do not replicate uh, limitlessly. They don't, they don't keep on dividing forever uh, and ever. Uh, we're going to talk about the limitations of that later. But it makes sense, right? Okay, Otherwise, we'd be like immortal, sort of. Um, it, the, the, the reason why the healer cells was able to grow indefinitely was because they are cancerous cells, right? So um, when later on in the course, when we learn about cancer, we will be able to see the distinction between regular cells and cancer cells. Um, and, and one of the things that happens to a cancer cell is that they, they can switch on a special protein that will allow them to become immortal. They could keep on dividing and dividing. Lastly, a uh, cell containing hered hereditary material like the DNA and the RNA, they will be passed on during cell division. Okay, so here if we have uh, one of the original cell, we call it a parent cell. Okay, so in humans, how many chromosomes do we have? Does anybody know? Chromosome is our genetic material, right? So how many chromosomes do we have? 52, I guess. Okay, 52. 20, 20 how many, sorry? 22 pairs. 22 pairs, yeah. Anyone else? I see 32. 23. 23, yeah. Okay, so we got all these numbers, right? We can buy a lottery ticket with them. <laughs> uh, good guess, everybody. Uh, the correct answer is 46 chromosomes, okay? Or 23 pairs. Right. So when the cell divides, okay, when it divides, right, the process is called mitosis, which we will learn later on as well. The um, the two cells that you get in the end, they're called daughter cells, and each of them would also have a total of forty six chromosomes. Okay. So here, these are onion cells. And you can see the cell is dividing right now, okay? And all these are genetic material, uh, chromosomes, right? So that's the four parts of the cell theory. So to study cells, we have to use a microscope, right? We, they are too small to see with a naked eye, and we need to have a microscope. The first microscope was invented by this guy. Um, his name is Antoni Van leave it hope all right so he had a handheld device uh with a lens over here and then he was studying pond waters right so he noticed that there are a lot of microorganisms that are living in the pond water you look at the pond water you don't see anything at all because they're too small right but when when you view it under this special lens he was able to see an entire uh, uh um uh 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 a population right, of these uh, of these individual cells, right? Things like the amoeba that we talk about, the paramecium. So that started the whole field of uh, of cell biology. Right? Nowadays, uh, this is a typical microscope that you will uh, use in um, in a uh, in a classroom. This is a compound light microscope. Um, the ones we have at school looks exactly like that. They are about like three four hundred dollars uh, each, uh, which is um, which is not too expensive. Certainly much cheaper compared to these high power microscope. Uh, so these are called transmitting, uh, trans transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope. Um, these are very, very powerful microscope that allows you to see very detailed structures of the cell. You're looking at the, um, uh, uh, remember I told you like the paramecium, they have these little hairs on them. Okay, so those are actually called cilia. We're going to talk about it later. Okay, I'm just writing it down right now. So this is a high power magnification of those cilia. Okay, so in our body, we actually have cilia as well. Okay, we have some in the airway that helps us remove trapped uh, dust particles. Right? So that's what they look like. And this, the, the scanning electron microscope allows you to have a three-dimensional view uh, of the structure that you're looking at. So these things are very expensive, okay? Um, they Sometimes they're as, as expensive as a luxury car, um, easily into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay? So 
you know, the $300 ones are, you know, pretty cheap, pretty economical. Uh, and it's useful for the purpose of, uh, you know, just studying um, uh, cells in a, in a classroom setting. All right, let's, uh, let's do a poll question. Oh, actually, you know what? I gotta, I gotta end the poll. I, I, I remember some of you say you cannot see the screen right when I launched the poll. So I'm gonna let you read the question first, make your choice, and then I will launch the poll. Okay, very good. Uh, everybody got the right answer. Everybody who chose something got the right answer. That's good. How about this one? Okay, so people are all over the place for this one. Um, all the cells must have the following, except for except for the nucleus. Okay, except for the nucleus, they all have cytoplasm. They all have genetic material and plasma membrane. Okay, let me just go back to show you the slide right here. Right, okay. cell membrane, which is the outside here, genetic material either in the form of DNA or RNA or both, and then cytoplasm. Okay, I know the picture shows you a nucleus, but like I said earlier, right? Nucleus are only found in some cells, not all cells. And these are the common features. Okay, so the answer is C. All right, next one. Eukaryotic cells. So, so we're gonna start by looking at different kinds of cells, right? Okay, so the first one we're gonna uh, first distinction we're going to make is the difference between eukaryotic cells. Sometimes eukaryotic cells are just called eukaryotes. Okay. These cells are bigger, more complex compared to the other kind, the prokaryotic cells, okay, which we're going to look at in the next slide. And uh, the eukaryotic cells, they have nucleus in the center. The nucleus is basically a structure in the middle that contains DNA. Okay. So the genetic material is well protected within the nucleus. Um, and the eukaryotic cells also have many different types of organelles with specialized functions. As you can see here, there are some mitochondria, they might have some chloroplasts, if we we're talking about plant cell, endoplasmic reticulum. So we're gonna be talking about all these structures okay, in, uh, in the rest of the lecture. But the point is eukaryotic cells, they have a lot of different types 
of these organelles. Animal cells and plant cells are examples of eukaryotes. Okay, so our body cells, all of them are eukaryotic cells. Now, uh, I know it says here eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, right? But there are some exceptions, okay? Like in our body, for example, our, our red cells, red blood cells, even though they're eukaryotic cells because they're within us, they actually don't have a nucleus. So, you know, in, in science, a lot of times, um, you know, we have generalization, right? But often there are exceptions to these generalizations. So it's not like black and white uh, rules, right? So that's eukaryotic cells. Um, this is a prokaryotic cell. Uh, let's draw it together uh, to um, so that you know it it, it will uh, it will make more sense here. Um, so we're gonna have our general cell. This is a bacterium. Okay, so of course it has the cell membrane. Cell membrane, and actually. Outside of the cell membrane, uh, they have extra protection. Extra protection uh, called the cell wall. Right? Some bacteria has really, really thick cell wall and regular antibiotics cannot kill them. Right? Others, they have thinner ones and you know, antibiotics are more effective against them. Instead of having a nucleus, because this is a prokaryotic cell, prokaryotic, uh, the genetic material is just kind of scattered in the middle. Okay. So this is genetic material. Now, what I really want to tell you about is that in addition to the core genetic material, they have special circular DNA that are just, you know, floating around there. Okay, so these are called plasmid. And you will learn a lot more about plasmid later in the course. These are circular DNA that gives the bacteria special properties. Okay, so like this one might allow it to grow some hair, right? Which will allow them to attach better to a surface so they don't get washed off easily. Okay, this one might make it a thicker wall and so on and so forth. All right, so let me give you an example of what's going on here. Let's say we have one bacteria. Okay, we'll, say, we'll call this like bacterium A, and it has a red plasmid. This red plasmid allows it to become resistant to the red antibiotic. Okay, so this is like a, like a pill. Okay, so this is like antibiotic. Okay, so let's say, you know, someone got sick because they, they get infected by this bacteria and you try to treat it with the red antibiotic, it doesn't work because the bacteria has the special red plasmid that allows it to maybe break down the antibiotic. So you're not going to get better. So the doctor is like, okay, I'll give you the purple antibiotic, right? And is the purple one going to work? Looks like it's going to work, right? Because the bacteria only has the red plasma that breaks down the red antibiotic, right? Okay, so this one will not work, but this one will work, right? Okay, so this is, this is, this is person A, okay? He's happy now because the drug is making him feel better. Now, somewhere else, bacterium B, okay? This one happens to have a purple plasmid. Okay, and this is another person. Okay. And she got infected by this bacteria and the doctor gave her 
antibi red antibiotic. Is it going to work? Is it going to kill the bacteria? Hopefully your answer is yes, right? Okay. Because this one is resistant to the, to the purple one, right? Okay, so the red one is going to be okay, but you know it's uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna work for the for the purple one. Do you guys have any questions so far? Do you know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> Some days I just ramble on, and I'm not sure if people are following me. Any questions? Seriously. Okay, so let's say they they both have the same doctor, right? Okay, so they go to the same clinic. And then uh, this person was like coughing <laughs> all over the desk. Maybe he's cough in the hand and touch some desk surface. So now on the desk, okay, or the chair, whatever, right? So let's, so on the desk, there is going to be a bunch of these bacteria with the red plasmid. And then this person came here, same thing, <laughs> right? Cough all over the place. And then you're going to have the... Uh, purple bacteria here, okay? And this is where very scary things can happen. This is for real, okay? Like I'm not making this up, right? Like this actually does happen in the real life. These two bacteria, okay? They will find each other. Okay? They fall in love and they decided to have babies, okay? So they will have a process called conjugation. That's what it's called. It's basically bacterial sex. They will exchange their plasmid. And then in the end, the red one will make a copy of the red plasmid and give it to the other guy. And then the purple one will make a copy of the purple plasmid and give it to the other one. And now we have a new kind of bacteria that is resistant to both uh, the red antibiotic and the purple antibiotic, right? So another person come, this one is just here for like a body check, okay? Doesn't, it's not sick or anything. Happens to touch this surface with this new bacteria, got it into their system and now got sick. So what kind of antibiotics should we give to treat this person? Should we give them the red one or the purple one? Both. Nothing works for this person. That's right. Nothing will work. The red one will not work because it has the red plasma. The purple one will not work. Or maybe we need a green antibiotic now, right? You understand? Now, this ha process actually happens very often, okay? Uh, and we accelerate this process because of misuse of antibiotics. And ultimately, it creates what's called superbug. I, I don't know if you've heard of superbug, uh, but it's one of the... Uh, serious threats that are threatening humanity. Uh, you know, they're saying by 2050, right, superbug will be responsible for a majority of, uh, of death um, uh, in humans. Okay, if you don't know what superbugs are, you can look it up. But basically, these are multi, multi drug resistant bacteria. Okay, so an example of a superbug is something called MRSA, methicillin resistant S. aureus. When you get admitted to the hospital at the triage, sometimes they will ask you, have you been previously uh, been infected with MRSA? Okay, another one they ask you is VRE, right? So both those are like super bugs that are common in, in, uh, in hospital settings, right? So imagine instead of having two special plasma, these super bugs, they have like, multiple, a whole library collection of these plasmids that makes them resistant to, you know, uh, not just individual antibiotics. Sometimes it could make them uh, immune to a whole group of antibiotics, right? So penicillin, for example, there are a whole group of uh, different types of penicillin, right? So they could be resistant to all of them at the same time. Does that make sense? Hope so. So that is that is the prokaryote. All right, prokaryote. All right, let's come back to this here. Uh, they don't have a nucleus, but that gives them the ability to have these mobile plasma, right? To exchange freely. 
Uh, there are these uh, few organelles, and most bacteria are um, prokaryotes. Okay, so now let's let's take a closer look at some of the cellular structures, starting with the cell membrane. Okay, so all cells, as I told you, are surrounded by plasma membrane. And if you watch the recordings for lecture two, you would know that the major component of the plasma membrane is the phospholipid. Okay, so the cell membrane creates this selectively permeable barrier that separates the internal environment with the outside. You can't just let things come in and let things leave without any kind of regulation, right? We want to keep the bad things out of the cell, right? We want to keep the good nutrients in the cell. So that's why the barrier is going to be selectively permeable, okay? Things are going to be uh, regulated in a controlled manner. So the phospholipid, as you might remember, has a hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic tails. So the hydrophobic tails are sandwiched between the hydrophilic heads right, and form a barrier on the inside. This is what the actual cell membrane looks like when you use an electron microscope. You can see the two thick black lines. Those are the hydrophilic heads. And then in the wide uh, space in the middle, that's where the hydrophobic tails are going to be. The cell membrane is not just uh, found on the surface of the cell. Uh, some organelles inside the cell are also uh, going to be surrounded by plasma membrane. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay, something called the mitochondria. That's an example of an organelle that has its own plasma membrane as well. And so we'll, like, don't worry about what that does now. We'll talk about it later. I'm just giving you an example. So later when you revisit the note, when we have learned about mitochondria already, right, it will make sense. So let's look at the nucleus. Remember the nucleus are only found, only found in eukaryotic cells, okay? Like human cells, plant cells, okay? So here we have the nucleus and it's going to be surrounded by an envelope, a nuclear envelope, okay? On this nuclear envelope, you would have little openings, pores, that will allow things to go in and come out of the nucleus, okay? And that nuclear envelope actually forms a continuous network that would extend outward into the cytoplasm. Now, all this can be a little bit abstract and uh, hard to visualize. Um, so, you know, what I'm gonna do is we, I actually encourage people to draw it out together with me and kind of construct the cell that way. I mean, if you've learned this before, then, you know, maybe it's uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward stuff, but, you know, some of us might not have seen this before or, you know, we have learned it a long time ago. So it's it's good to, you know, just try to, try to learn it uh, from scratch. Okay, so if you could, all right, maybe get a piece of paper and then we're gonna draw this out together. I love drawing uh, stuff in uh, in biology and uh, and anatomy. Okay, I think it it's a great tool to learn. It doesn't have to be a nice drawing. Okay, it just have to be you know informative. Okay, so here we we go again. We have the nucleus right here. Okay, the nucleus. I'm gonna put a label here. Nucleus. And on the surface of the nucleus, we are going to have an envelope. Okay, and then we're gonna put some gaps here and there. Okay, we're not gonna circle the whole thing. We're just gonna leave a little bit of a gap here and there. There we go. All right, so that is the nuclear envelope.
okay, which surrounds the nucleus, right? And then these, these little openings, these little gaps, right? Those are the nuclear pores, which allows, allow things to enter or leave the nucleus. You're like, what kind of things would want to leave the nucleus? I'll show you in a second, okay? Now, in the middle of the nucleus, you are going to have an other circular structure. Okay, so this thing is called a nucleolus, nucleolus, nucleolus. And the nucleolus produce, produces an other organelle, which is called the ribosome. I'll explain that in a second, okay? So, for example, when you produce the ribosomes in the nucleolus, they have to come out of the nucleus, right? If the whole thing is wrapped, then you can't come out, right? So that's why there are a little bit of gaps. So the ribosomes will be able to leave the nucleus. Okay, so that's one of the things that will be uh, going through the pores. Okay, so if you have trouble visualizing this, um, you can think of a peach, okay? Like a fuzzy peach. Okay? So the skin of the peach would be like the nuclear envelope, right? The seed of the peach is the nucleolus, okay? And the meat of the peach, that's this area here inside the nucleus. And that is where you will find the genetic material. So it contains genetic material. Okay, in the form of chromatin. Okay. So chromatin are just DNA that are packaged with proteins. Right? DNA on its own is really, really long, right? If you don't wrap them up, they will get tangled and they will not fit in the nucleus. So that's why we are going to wrap them around proteins. And in that form, we call it chromatin. Right? So here we have some chromatin, right? That's what these red strands are. Chromatin, it is... Uh, DNA plus protein. Right? Think of sewing threads, right? They, you have to put those threads around a, a core, right? A spool, I think that's what they were called. And then you can pack them nicely in a sewing kit, right? Otherwise, it's like very, very long and then it's going to get tangled and, you know, it's just going to be a big mess. Okay, so that's that's what it is. Any questions so far with this uh, picture? We're not done with the picture. We're going to draw more. But uh, please ask me anything. Yes, this entire thing is the nucleus, uh, Stephen. This whole thing. Okay, these are just the different parts of the nucleus. Okay. So this nuclear envelope that we have drawn, uh, this, another question. this applies to all cells with the nucleus? Yes. All right, so eukaryotic cells, right? Very good. Okay, so this nuclear envelope actually um, will extend outward into the cytoplasm. Okay, it will form these, you know, extra network. And, and and sometimes they could go even further out. Okay, I'm just going to use a different color like that. Okay. So it's a continuation of 
the nuclear envelope. Now, backtrack a little bit. In the nucleolus, we're going to produce these ribosomes. I haven't told you what they do yet. But the ribosomes will, when they're, when they're created, they will come out through the nuclear pores. Some of the ribosomes will just be freely floating in the cytoplasm. But some of them will be stuck to this network that are extending out from the nuclear envelope, OK? So these little purple balls, dots, right? these are ribosomes, OK? So some are just free floating. Others, they are stuck to this network. Okay, so this part here, this network of membranes with the ribosomes on it, they look a little bit rough on the surface. It's like bumpy, right? So people call it the rough, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Endoplasmic means it's a network of membrane inside the cell. Reticulum is like a bunch of channels, basically. So this stuff here, that's the endoplasmic reticulum, R-E-R. -E Further out, right? again, it's still continuous with this network. We have more network, but these these networks don't have the ribosomes on them, so they look a little bit smooth. So we call it smooth endoplasmic reticulum, S-E-R. Okay, I haven't told you what they do yet. I just want to show you what they look like. Okay. So that's as much as we will draw for now. We put that aside, we can come back to it. Uh, but I just wanted to see if you guys are okay with the diagram. Is there anything you want me to clarify? Don't worry about the function just yet. I'll tell you the functions in a bit. Okay. Now that you have drawn it, Okay, uh, you want to take a picture? Sure. I'm, I'll post the notes though, okay? So like, you know, maybe no need to take a picture for now, but, but there you go, okay, take, take one if you want. That's all people do now in my class, like when I have an in-person class, like people just take pictures uh, <laughs> of the board instead of copying the notes. Um, maybe it's a new thing. And I always say, oh, there, there you go, take another picture that you will not look at. On your phone. Anyway, so that that's what this is. I I I, I was trying to draw this thing right in, in our own way. We have the nuclear envelope, and then you see all these yellow dots, the yellow balls. Those are the ribosomes. If the membrane, the network, has the ribosomes on them, then we call them rough ER. If they don't, then we call them smooth ER. So uh, the nucleus, right? Like I said, it contains the DNA, which is in the form of chromatin. Okay, so we have the individual DNA, double helix, which you should be familiar by now. And then you will wrap them around these uh, proteins, these packaging proteins, the yellow ones. Okay, And then it forms chromatin. Later on, when you need to do cell division, you will wrap, you will condense it further and then you will get the chromosome. So essentially, chromosome, chromatin, and the, and the double helix, they are all DNA, but with different degrees of condensation. Like how, 
how compact are, are we talking about? If it's super, super condensed, it's the most condensed form, that's the chromosome. In its most um, uncondensed form, that would be the DNA itself. Okay, so to help it condense, to help it wrapped and package, we need the packaging proteins. Okay, they're called histone proteins. We talk about the nucleolus, which is at the center, right? And it makes the uh, ribosome. Sorry, Professor, can you please um, go to the previous uh, slide and explain it again? This one? Do you have a specific question about the... Um, the histone and stuff. Okay, so the DNA is just a long DNA fiber, right? So the fiber gets tangled up easily, which is why we need to wrap them up. Okay, so like these are the histones. Think of a yo-yo. You guys know a yo-yo, right? Yo-yo has the string, right? Okay, so what do we do with the string on the yo-yo? We take the string and then we wrap it around the yo-yo, right? Can you visualize that? So the yo-yo is like the histone proteins and the string is like the DNA, okay? So except for like wrapping around one yo-yo, we are gonna wrap it around another one, right? And then you're gonna wrap it around another one and then another one, right? So that, that's what this is looking like, okay? So by wrapping the DNA around these histone proteins, they become more condensed, right? You, you can move them around easier, okay? So this is just different level of how condensed it is. The most condensed form is the chromosome, right? And then in the, in the, in the, in the nucleus of a regular cell, they exist as the chromatin. Is that better? Memphier? Thank you, Professor. Yeah. All right, so what is the ribosome, right? We know that they are made in the nucleolus, right, the seed of the P tray, I was saying. And the ribosome actually has two uh, subunits. It has a large subunit and a small subunit. Think of it like a, like a burger, right? The top and the bottom, right? Two, two pieces. And it's made up of protein and a little bit of RNA. And the purpose of the ribosome is to do protein synthesis. You should know for the purpose of today's quiz that proteins are made up of amino acids, right? So when we want to build a polypeptide, you have to take one amino acid, connect it with another, right? To form the peptide bond. And then you got to add another amino acid and another amino acid. So the ribosome is responsible for connecting the right amino acids together to form the long chain, okay? So in this real picture, all these black dots in the background, those are the ribosomes. Again, it has a large subunit and a small subunit. Okay, so ribosomes are made again in the nucleolus, they exit into the cytoplasm through the nuclear pores, the gaps in the membrane, right? Some ribosome exists freely in the cytoplasm. They're just floating around like the ones we've drawn, okay? or they are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So if you're gonna come up with like, a, uh, like those flashcards to memorize this, ribosome is the protein factories. They make proteins. That's the key thing to, uh, to know. Now, there is something called the central dogma of biology, the central theme. That's what dogma means, right? Central theme, central idea of biology. I'm just going to introduce it to you now. And actually, we will spend the entire lecture uh, six and seven talking about it. Yeah, but I just want to introduce it here. We have DNA, DNA actually contains instruction. To make proteins, right? Again, it's something that you should know because of lecture two, right? But DNA is really, really long and, and you know, it has the instruction to make all the proteins that we need in the body, right? So you don't need to have all the proteins 
all the time, right? You only need to make certain ones at any given time. So what we do is we, we, we take a copy of the segment of DNA that we need, and then we create a messenger RNA from it. Okay. Think about it like this. There is a really good encyclopedia at the library. Okay. Like you need some information from it, but they won't let you uh, take it out of the library. Okay. So what do you do? You make photocopies of the pages that you need, right? So essentially the messenger RNA is a copy of the segment of DNA that you need to make a particular protein. So that process of making a copy of DNA in the form of RNA, that's called transcription. Transcription. Okay, so this process here, that's transcription. Once you made the RNA, you will take it into the cytoplasm and they can exit through the nuclear pores, right? So that's another thing that can leave the pores. And in the cytoplasm, the ribosome, which is the protein factory, will attach onto the messenger RNA, right? The top portion and the bottom portion will clamp onto the messenger RNA and it will read the information on the RNA and then it will build the protein. Okay? So the process of making the protein using information from RNA, that's called translation. Okay? So DNA to RNA, right? This here, we'll call it uh, we'll call it step one, that's transcription. That happens in the nucleus. And then from RNA to protein, that's step number two. We call that translation. And that happens in the cytoplasm. All right. That's the central theme of biology. So understanding how proteins are made allows us to uh, tweak the process in some cases, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and this is very useful in biotechnology, for example. Okay, let's just do uh, two poll questions and then we can take a short break. Which of the following is a prokaryote? Prokaryote. All right, I'm going to close the poll in a couple of seconds. Um, just choose something if you could. Okay. Thank you for participating. Uh, so, prokaryotes are uh, no nucleus, right? Bacteria, right? So, liver cell, liver cell is from humans. Liver, right? Liver tells you it's from human. So that, that's a eukaryote. That's not the answer. HeLa cells, also from human, right? The cervical cancer right? cells, right? From, uh, from the patient, uh, Herietelex. So that's, that's eukaryote. E. coli. Right? You guys should know E. coli is a bacteria, right? Sometimes you hear an E. coli outbreak in the, um, uh, in the local water reserve or something like that. And then it causes people to get very sick, right? So that's a bacteria. That's prokaryote. Amoeba is a single cell organism that lives in the fresh water. Um, that one is the uh, eukaryote as well. One more. Sir, could you tell us why E. coli is right? E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria, right? You, have you heard of E. coli as a bacteria before? Or is this is the first time yes. you... Yeah, so yeah. like but the fact that it's a bacteria tells you it's prokaryote, right? Oh. So any, any bacteria. 
Do you guys know anything, any, uh, any other ones uh, besides uh, E. coli? Any other bacteria? Sometimes you see, you hear about Salmonella. these. Sorry, what's that? Salmonella. Salmonella, that's right, right. Salmonella outbreak, right? Okay, throw away your uh, lattice because of salmonella outbreak or something like that, right? The recall, right? Food recalls. Okay, what is the function of the nucleolus? Let's see if you get this one right. I am hopeful that most of you will get this right. Already, uh, the correct answer is produces ribosomes. Okay, produces ribosomes. Okay, that's what the note says, right? Uh, in terms of protecting the chromatin, that's just the nucleus in general. Control movements in and out of the nucleus, that's the nuclear pores. Makes copy of DNA in the form of RNA. That's not the function of uh, of the nucleolus. Okay, that's just the process of transcription, right? All right, uh, let's take a five minute break. We will resume at 9.38. Okay, see you in a bit. All right, let's keep going. So uh, now that we have talked about the, um, you know, some of the key structures that are found in the cell, we're gonna go on and learn more about them. Okay? And we will soon see that the stuff that we talked about some of them belongs to what's called the endomembrane system. Okay? So as the name implies, endo means within, right? So the endomembrane system is a, is a system of basically a bunch of membranes that are found in the cytoplasm. Okay? So these are membranes within the cell membrane, right? so endomembrane. So these are, like I said, uh, a network of membranes that forms tubes, sometimes sacs in the, uh, in the cytoplasm, excuse me. And this system is responsible for uh, producing lipids and proteins and other large molecules. And sometimes you will be in, uh, involved in breaking them down as well, depending on which part of the endomembrane system you're looking at. Um, and we try to recycle a lot of these molecules because they are valuable resources. Like when you break down a protein, you get amino acids, right? But then we can use those amino acids to build other proteins, right? So it's a, it's a nonstop uh, cycle of, you know, breaking down macromolecules and then rebuilding it um, in, uh, in, in, in the kinds that we, uh, we need. So that would be the job of the endomembrane system. So here are the key components of the endomembrane system. And we already drew three of them, right? We have the nuclear envelope, which extends outward into the cytoplasm to form the rough ER, which then extend further to form the smooth ER. But then there are also additional things like the Golgi bodies, or sometimes called the Golgi apparatus, as well as the lysosome. Okay? So we will be learning about each one of these. Starting with the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so we already know this is a continuous network um, from the uh, from the nuclear envelope. They are attached together, and uh, they are rough because they are covered with these uh, ribosomes. But what exactly does it do? Well, we already know that the ribosomes are responsible for making proteins, right? So they could do that either freely on their own if they are just floating in the cytoplasm, right? So that's translation. Uh, or if they are part of the endoplasmic reticulum, then what happens is you can see in this picture, there is a ribosome on the surface of the rough ER and it will produce the protein directly into the inside of the rough ER. And this thing is going to, when it's done, the protein will move towards the edge 
and then a bit of the rough ER will pinch off and becomes a vesicle. So now you have proteins that are inside this, this pocket. Uh, let me try to draw this uh, 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 for you in our, in our picture. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit here. So what it will look like on our picture is this. Okay, you will, let me choose a sharp color for the protein. Okay, so over here, that's the ribosome. The ribosome will make the protein. Oops, will make the protein. The protein will be uh, put inside the rough ER. Okay, and once it's done, it will move towards the edge, the protein. And then the next thing that would happen is that uh, uh, this thing will pinch off. It's it's like you know pulling off a bit of dole, right, or, or like play doh, right, uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from blob. And then inside will be your your protein. Okay, so here this would be uh, a vesicle containing. Proteins. Okay, so so that's that's what's happening. Right? Maybe you're going to make another protein here, another protein, and they all will move towards the edge, and then you will pinch off a bubble, right, to form the vesicle, and then this vesicle can go somewhere else. Okay. So that's the rough ER. Now the smooth ER is uh, similar, but um, instead of making proteins, they are responsible for producing lipids. Okay. So um, one example of lipids that you learn in lecture two is steroids. Right? So steroid hormones are uh, important for signaling. Okay. So you, you make steroid hormones. Do, do, do you guys remember an example of steroid hormones from lecture two? Anybody? It was in the PowerPoint slides. I just want to. Estrogen, testosterone. That's right. So there's the estrogen, testosterone, right? So these things are made in the ovaries or testes. Um, and, and so ovarian cells or testicular cells, right? Uh, cells from the ovaries and testicles, basically you would expect them to have a lot of smooth ER, right? To be able to make all these um, steroid hormones, okay? In addition to uh, making various lipids, the smooth ER is also responsible for breaking down fats and detoxifying drugs. When I say drugs, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, illegal drugs, right? Like if you take medication, Right, for you know, for illness, those drugs needs to be uh, metabolized and detoxify as well, uh, and, and that happens um, with the help of smooth ER. So organs like liver, whose job is to primarily detoxify the blood, you would expect them to have uh, more smooth ER in them. Okay, so that's the. Uh, that's a smooth ER right here, and that's the rough ER. Okay, so let's talk about the Golgi apparatus. Let's um, draw it in our picture here. Okay. So apart from everything that we have here, uh, like all the way out, uh, uh, further out, I guess, from, from the nucleus, you will have these uh, stacks of membranes. Okay, so they're, they're not like continuous like these ones. They are just like a bunch that are in very close proximity. Okay, so like this, like that. All right, so this thing is called the Goji, Goji body. Now remember that vesicle that we got, right? Uh, that from that we got from the uh, 
from the rough ER. And let's just, just draw another vesicle here. Okay, so we, we have maybe another vesicle that came out. It's going to have some proteins in it. Okay, so it turns out this vesicle sometimes is not quite ready yet. Right? And then the vesicle will actually travel to the Golgi body. It will, it will fuse with the first membrane. And then there will be some sorting that goes on. There will be some reorganization. And then they will pass the bubble to the next one and then pass it and the next one. And sometimes they have to go back and forth a couple of times. And then in the end, they will repackage, repackage the protein. Excuse me. They will repackage the protein into a new vesicle. So the purpose of the Golgi body is to uh, uh, sort, modify, and repackage contents of vesicles. The vesicles are coming from the rough ER, right? Okay, so we'll go to Goji. This is like the sorting center, if you would. Okay, so I'm just gonna blow my nose briefly. Allergies are killing me. Excuse me. Okay, so that that's what it does. So now you after you know going back and forth a couple of times, you're gonna have a new vesicle, a new uh, 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 protein. Right? It's not a new protein, but like a modified protein, right? it's a little bit different than than before. And there are various uh, destination for this vesicle. Right? It can do a couple of things. Okay, number one, it can be uh, released. From the cell. Right? So if, if you need the protein in the blood or something, then the cell, the, the vesicle will travel to the cell membrane and then it will release the content and then you can use it in the blood. Okay, so release from the cell. Or you can store it, right? stored in the cytoplasm. until it is needed, okay? Sometimes it's good to make more uh, 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 protein first and then uh, use it when you need to, okay? Uh, 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 it's not fast enough to make it on demand, right? In some cases, so you want to store, you want to have a good stop of it and then, um, and then just, uh, just use it when you need to. Okay. Sometimes the protein, as we'll learn in next uh, lecture, uh, is going to become part of the cell membrane. You actually have a lot of proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane and they do all sorts of different functions. Okay. And then uh, lastly, right, it could specialize and become becomes becomes a lysosome. And that's kind of like the last component of the endomembrane system that we will that we will talk about. Okay. So just to quickly recap. We make the protein in the rough ER. We will package it into a vesicle. The vesicle is not quite ready yet. So it goes to the Goji body. It gets moved forward and backwards. There's some modification going on. There's some sorting going on. When it's all said and done, you're going to repackage it into a new vesicle. And this new vesicle can do a couple of things. You can release it out of a cell if you need it right away. You can store it for later use. It can become part of the cell membrane to carry out specific functions, which we haven't learned yet. Or it can become a lysosome. And I'll tell you what a lysosome does in a bit as well. Any questions?
Okay. So, what is a lysosome? Lysosome is a special kind of vesicle, if you would. It's part of the endomembrane system, as I mentioned. And it contains a collection of digestive enzymes, okay? So uh, these enzymes are going to be used for breaking down different types of macromolecules. Some enzymes will break down carbohydrates. Some enzymes will break down lipids, so on and so forth. Depending on what kind of macromolecules you want to break down, you will need to have a specific um, digestive enzymes for it. Okay. So uh, your white cells, for example, will do a lot of uh, eating. Okay. So not necessarily like food, but it will eat up like a bacteria or something, and it would need to break it down. Right? So once it has engulfed the bacteria, it would uh, fuse it with the lysosome, and then the enzyme in the lysosome will, will kill the bacteria, for example. We can also use the lysosome to kill off old and worn out uh, organelles. So sometimes the organelles are not functioning the way that they're supposed to. You want to break it down. You want to free up some uh, resources for the cell. So it will go to the lysosome and it gets broken down. Right? Think of the lysosome as the uh, garbage disposal or the recycling center. Right? You break things down. If you can recover the resources, great. Otherwise, you just break it down. The lysosome uh, can also destroy the cell, uh, can, can kill off the cell. Sometimes this is done deliberately. When we were developing as a fetus, um, between our fingers, there are actually webs. Okay, that's part of normal fetal development. And, and we need those cells to go away, right? So that our fingers can be detached, right? So those cells need to die. So the lysosome, the lysosome is going to uh, release all of its contents in those cells and cause them to die. So this process of deliberate cell death that's called apoptosis. Okay, program cell death. Right? And, you know, it happens in normal growing adults as well, right? Even though we don't have webs anymore, we sometimes do, the, the cells sometimes uh, trigger apoptosis if something is wrong with the cell. If you have a cell that's behaving strangely, Right, you, you want to get rid of it. Right? You don't want it. For example, if a cell is dividing too rapidly, you want to kill it off. Right? You don't want it to give it the opportunity to become a tumor. And right? so it triggers apoptosis. And one way to do that is by releasing all of the enzymes in the lysosome, and the cell will die off uh, from that. Okay. Now, the lysosome enzymes are very important for normal bodily function. Okay, we're, we're not just using them to kill off the cells, right? We actually need it for, like I said, breaking down a lot of the macromolecules that, that we have. Uh, and there is a collection of enzymes in these uh, lysosomes, and people are still trying to study exactly how many different kinds are there. Uh, but we do know that these enzymes are protein-based enzymes. Uh, which means in order to make these enzymes, you need the DNA for it, right? So if there is a mutation in the DNA, it could cause some of these enzymes to be missing or not functioning properly. Right? So that is a group of disease called lysosomal storage disease. Okay, that's when the DNA code that gives you the instruction to make these enzymes are wrong uh, and it will cause the person to be missing certain digestive enzymes in the lysosome. Most of these diseases are actually fatal in early childhood. Um, although some of them, you know, you, you will be able to survive, but there will be very, very uh, bad side effects, right, as a result of disease. One example is pumper disease, uh, where there is a harmful accumulation of glycogen in muscle cells. Right, so we learned about glycogen in lecture two. It's a storage form of energy. But if you just keep on storing them and you're not able to break them down because you're missing the enzyme in the lysosome, for example, then they accumulate to a toxic level, right? especially in the muscle cell. Uh, so that could lead to mobility issue. And if this happens in the heart, it would cause cardiovascular problems. right? 
Another one is Tay-Sachs disease. You might have heard of it. This is one of the things that they screen for uh, during um, you know, prenatal screening. And uh, in this case, a lipid digesting enzyme is, is, is missing in the lysosome. So you have these um, lipids that are building up in the brain cells, uh, which interferes with um, uh, mental development. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it could cause the, the brain to, to have irreversible damage. So these are just two brief examples of lysosomal disease. If you, if you look this up on the internet, you'll get a full list. Um, and a lot of these are hereditary because like I said, right, to make the, to make the enzyme, you need the DNA code. And if something's wrong with the DNA code, you can pass it on to the next generation. So this is a good picture that summarizes the uh, endomembrane system. I did that a couple of times already, so I, I'm not going to go through it. But you know, you should you should go uh, study this diagram and and see if you can write out exactly what's going on at each of these uh, these points. All right, poll questions. Let's do it. What is the ribosome made up of? All right, I got nine people who chose something. Please lock in your answers before I end the poll. All right, thank you uh, for answering. The correct uh, choices are RNA and proteins, right? The ribosome is made of RNA and proteins and the ribosomes are created in the nucleolus, nucleolus. Another one. So like on today's quiz, right, you will have some of these multi-select questions where you have to choose all the correct answers, right? Not just one of them. Okay, so for this one, the correct answers are a lysosome, right? Most people chose that. And the other one is smooth ER. If you go back to the slide that we talk about, the smooth ER, not only is it responsible for making lipids, but it's also needed for detoxifying drugs, right? And breaking down lipids. So the answer are C and D. All right, we have about 20 minutes. Let's move on and talk about other organelles. Next up, we have something called the peroxisomes. Okay, peroxisomes are not part of the endomembrane system. Okay, everything else we're gonna mention now is not part of the endomembrane system, all right? Um, it's it's very similar to lysosome, uh, like when you look at them under the microscope. So this is like a real picture. This is a lysosome and this is a peroxisome. And there is no way you would be able to tell, right? Like 
unless you are trained to see it, right? Uh, on, a, on a color diagram, right? <laughs> it's color per, uh, green for some reason for the peroxisome. And then for the lysosome, it's like, you know, color pink, but they are like, you know, just circles, right? So it, it's really hard to tell. Uh, because of that, I'm never gonna ask you to label a peroxisome or a lysosome on a test. It's just not possible to tell them apart. Um, yeah, go ahead, you have a question, Tosh? Yes, um, so I had a question regarding the multi-select uh, questions. Sure, yeah. Um, so let's say you have a multi-select question that has three correct answers, mm -hmm. but you select two. Will yeah. you get partial? Uh, yeah, you marks? will get partial mark, yeah. But the, exactly how the marks are calculated is a little bit complicated. Uh, it depends on how many choices there are in the question. Um, I cannot explain how that is done. But in, in um, I can explain to you later. I mean, like I cannot explain it now. Uh, but uh, what you need to know is the final grade will be the correct answer minus the uh, incorrect answer. Okay, so let's say there are five choices and then there are two that you're supposed to check off. So if you check off additional ones, you will lose mark. If you miss some that you're supposed to check off, you will also lose marks. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Yep, so those are two marks each. All right, so make sure you read the question carefully and uh, choose wisely. Okay, so peroxisome, um, they carry out what's called oxidation reaction. Okay, oxidation reaction. Uh, keep, to keep it simple, oxidation reactions are reactions that involves, involves removing electrons. Okay, so uh, by removing electrons, you, you will be able to break certain things down. Uh, and it creates a byproduct called H2O2. We talked about H2O2 before, right? It's, perox uh, it's peroxide, right? Okay, so this peroxide uh, is harmful, and that's why the reaction must happen inside these specialized peroxisome. If the H2O2 gets out, it's going to damage the cell and probably cause quite a bit of problem. The function of the peroxisome is to break down macromolecules again. They also help in detoxifying uh, uh, various poisons. So you will find a lot of peroxisomes in the liver. So if I go back to this question, right, if I add a third choice here, if I have peroxisomes on it as well, you would choose that as part of the answer. Right? So lysosome, smooth ER, and now peroxisomes, they are all uh, important in you know breaking down molecules right detoxifying the body uh this question should have been uh you know earlier on uh but whatever it's here now let's quickly do that okay you should know the answer there's just one answer here Please choose the correct one. All right, uh, the correct answer is inside a peroxisome. All right, so if you produce a protein in the ER, right, we, we, we do it, right, remember? Let me see if I can bring up the picture here. It can be released from a cell, can be stored in the cytoplasm until later on, can become part of the cell membrane, it literally is right here, right, the answer. Um, so the only place that is not gonna be is, uh, it's not gonna be inside the peroxisome because the peroxisome is not part of the endomembrane system, right? Hope that makes sense. 
Okay, next we're going to talk about the mitochondria, and I want to draw the mitochondria with you because understanding the structure of the mitochondria is important for uh, later on uh, in, in lecture five, actually. Okay, so let's let's draw a mitochondria together. So first of all, the mitochondria is the uh, powerhouse of the cell. It produces energy. Mitochondria. Okay. This is singular. Plural is RIA. Okay. So this is one mitochondrion, many mitochondria. So what does it look like? Well, it is going to have a double membrane. So there is the outer membrane. And then on the inside, you will have an inner membrane that's folded up. All right. So over here, outer membrane. And then all these stuff on the inside, that's the inner membrane. Sorry, spelling mistake membrane. Okay, so it's a membrane within a membrane. The uh, the end in a membrane, I should say, is folded up into finger-like. That's what they're called. Finger-like. They're like fingers. Projections. Called Christe. And the function of this is to, which increases surface area for reactions. Okay, so in the mitochondria, as you will see later, there are a lot of reactions that are going on to help you make energy. Okay, energy production. So the more space you have for it, the more efficient the process is going to be. Between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, you're going to have some space here. That's called the intermembrane space. And there's going to be some things that are going on in there, which we'll learn later on. And last but not least, we are going to have the matrix here. Okay, the matrix is on the inside, the innermost portion. And there are some things going on there as well. But as far as the key structure goes, that's what it is. Okay. I'll give you a moment to copy everything. Can you explain the Christie? Like, what does it like? Explain what it does. Uh, okay. So, like, you know, if you have a, uh, if you have just the inner membrane like this, then it's smooth, right? But they they fold up like this. Okay. So these these little extra foldings allows you to have more surface area. Okay. So um, inside the Christie, there is a bunch of enzymes, as we will see later. A lot, a bunch of uh, proteins. Um, and, and all of these proteins are going to be doing some kind of reactions that we'll learn later. But basically, the more foldings you have, the more of these proteins you can pack into the, into the inner membrane. And, and with more of these proteins, you're able to do more reactions. That's basically what it means. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah, Mona. Yeah, but it's the uh, pictures, sorry. Say that one more time, please. And uh, yeah, this one. I like a uh, production called what? Uh, oh, projections, yeah. Call um, Christe, C-R-I-S-T-A-E. Okay, great. So, so, so oh, like so these things right here, right? Those are, those are the Christe. Okay, thank you so much. So 
you know, mitochondria is the site of energy production. That's where you will be doing part of the cellular respiration. Right? You remember cellular respiration from, again, lecture two, right? Where you take glucose and you're going to react it with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, right? And also energy. Right? So part of this reaction happens in the mitochondria. Um, if, if, if you have a cell that has a lot of energy demand, like a muscle cell, then you would expect to have a lot of mitochondria in it, okay? So some cells have very low energy demand, right? Like a fat cell, it doesn't really need to produce too much energy, so that has very few uh, mitochondria. Others, they would have thousands of them, okay? Depending on energy demand. This is just talking about the different structures, the outer membrane, inner membrane, and so on and so forth. We've already drawn everything. Um, that's the word criste here, the finger-like projections. Nice. Just go through it yourself. Okay, let's do uh, a few more. We have the uh, choroplasts. Okay, choroplast is found in cells that can do photosynthesis. So found in plants, and we should say, and other cells capable of photosynthesis. Okay, some, some uh, uh, pond living organisms, they can do photosynthesis. So they would have, they would have uh, some chloroplasts in it. Okay, so the chloroplast contains chlorophyll that allows plant to carry out photosynthesis. Okay, so people actually like it, I, th I think it's like a healthy trend or something. My students last semester were telling me that uh, you can buy chlorophyll extract from uh, from these health stores or from online or whatever, and people like to add it to their smoothies or something like that. Um, but you know, you can actually get chlorophyll from just eating vegetables, right? Like if you if you eat spinach or something, there's tons of chlorophyll in it, right? Uh, basically, anything that's green uh, uh, is going to contain the chlorophyll, right? Like mm -hmm. carrots would not have the chlorophyll because it's orange, right? But like other parts of the plant, that's green would have it. Yeah, Kushina, go ahead. No, I was just saying I have some to my fridge. Oh, you do the chlorophyll uh, extract, yeah? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. because they said that you can get it like a lot from yeah. the vegetables, like enough that you need. Right, right, it's yeah. It's like an internal, um, like antioxidant. Right, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the sales pitch, right? They're saying, you know, this, this stuff is, is concentrated, right? You are guaranteed to get supposedly the optimal dose right so some people some people like that no, it's totally fine yeah. yeah um so yeah that's that's chlorophyll uh and it's found in the coral plants uh just like the mitochondria it is double membrane um and then it has all these things that are stacked up they're called like thytocoids don't worry about this last point okay i, I don't have questions for you on the test about that okay the key thing to remember is that coral plants are found in Anything that can do photosynthesis and uh, it's double membrane and it contains chlorophyll. So uh, for those of you who don't know, photosynthesis is basically um, the ability to take carbon dioxide and then react it with water. That's why we have to water our plants and then they would get the carbon dioxide from the air and then with the um, sunlight, they will be able to convert it into glucose and oxygen. Okay, so that's photosynthesis, which is the backwards of cellular respiration. Okay. So the two processes complement each other, as is shown on the next slide. Okay, so the uh, products of photosynthesis are the ingredients for cellular respiration. Do we need to know this the, for the formulas? The... Yeah, probably it's a good idea. Like, uh, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, this is a lot of stuff, right? And again, right, like I'm telling you, 
this is online uh, testing, right? So I designed the test um, with uh, in my mind that you guys are gonna have access to your notes, right? Okay. So please, okay. yeah, please do not do the test without without any notes. I'm not saying not study and just have your notes. That will end terribly for you, guarantee. But it's okay to have a summary sheet of some of these key things that you found difficult to, to remember, right? So it's okay to, to reference, okay? Like I give you permission to do that, at least for my course. I can't speak for other uh, teachers, okay? But for my course, right, it's, it's okay to, to do that. Uh, right, so like they complement each other, right? Now for humans, we, we, we gotta eat our glucose from our food, right? When you eat your uh, bread, pasta, rice, whatever, right? You get the glucose and then our mitochondria will use those glucose to make energy for us. The difference for plant is that they will be able to create their own food. They create their own glucose through photosynthesis and then they can burn their own glucose with their mitochondria. Plants also have mitochondria because they also need to make energy, right? Remember the, the photosynthesis is not creating energy for them. It's actually creating food for them. And then they take the food and then they, they, they still have to uh, metabolize it to create the energy, okay? Of course they produce much more than they need and they store it in the form of starch. You might remember that, right? And then that's where we got the starch. When we, when we eat the potato, when we eat the yams and the cassava, we are actually taking the, uh, the starch that are stored in the plant, and then we use it for our cellular respiration, okay? So I think that's a good spot to, uh, to stop. We still have like, you know, 10, 20 slides or something like that. It's okay, we'll wrap up, wrap it up uh, next, um, when do I see you guys again? Uh, next Monday, okay? Uh, and we will also be doing lecture four next Monday as well. Uh, please, there is a question, go ahead. I am sorry, I can't quite hear you. Could you uh, come again, please? Uh, sorry, oh, oh you, you got to type the question. Okay, the test we, we want to do today. Yeah, what about it? It's a quiz, okay, 10%, lecture one and lecture two. No, that does not include this stuff. Okay, it's only lecture one and lecture two, the uh, scientific method as well as the uh, macromolecules. Okay, yeah. Please be sure to do it. Okay, don't wait until the end of the day. If you run into any computer problems or whatever, don't freak out. Just email me. We'll sort something out. Yeah, go ahead, Tash. Uh, I had a question about like the uh, short answer questions mm -hmm. um, where we have like type or answer. Yep. So I, I was wondering, are you looking for specific keywords that you mentioned in the lectures? Um, be, I, like, for example, like... Uh, uh, okay, yeah, I, I, I get what you say. Okay, so like, you know, if, if you're answering the question, you can answer it any way you want. Uh, but, you know, using terminologies that are proper would be useful, right? Okay, if, yeah. if I ask you to uh, explain how polymers are, are formed, you can't just tell me uh, you would link things together, right? Like, you know, <laughs> that, that's too vague, right? So, so I'm looking for proper terminologies, right? So um, monomers are connected together through dehydration synthesis that involves removing a water molecule from it, right? So there are certain key, key terms that you have to, that you have to um, include, right, in your answer. Having said that, I'm not just looking for key terms, right? If you're just throwing me terms without context, right? Without conveying to me that you understand what you're saying, that will also not give you full marks. Okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, there is another question. Okay, you do not have to print out anything. You do not have to scan anything. Everything is done online, okay? Even the short answer questions, okay? There will be like a box for you to type the answer in. Okay, everything is done online. You know what? I'm just gonna show you just just in case, right? Where to uh, to to get the uh, the quiz? Okay. So first of all, you, you have to log on to your course homepage. Let me switch myself to student view. Okay, and uh, you know this was the last announcement that I posed, and here's the link to the quiz. All you have to do is click on it. Uh, you click on it, 
And uh, it says it's available today, May 24th. That's today. Uh, from since this morning to tonight. Time allow is 45 minutes, one attempt. And when you're ready, you click start. And that's it. Okay, you do it on your window. Okay, there's no lockdown browser or anything like that. Okay, you, you just do it on your window. Okay, so once, once you click start, the timer will not stop. Okay, so you must finish it in one sitting. Yes, uh, Kushana. And the quiz will be based on everything, all the lectures that we had. One and two only. One and two. Yeah, not today's stuff, okay? And it's graded. And it's what? Graded. And it's graded? Will it be graded? Yes, yes, I'll be grading it, yes. Okay, thank you. 10% of your final mark. Okay. Uh, Maria and then Tash? We don't need to use the lockdown browser? You do not need to use a lockdown browser, not for my okay. course. Okay, you just okay, click start you. and it will go right away. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, Tash, go ahead. Uh, so I was wondering uh, how how many marks is the uh, short answer questions worth? Uh, I thought I told you, right? Did I? I don't remember, honestly. Uh, <laughs> let me see here. 70 multiple choice, five multiple select question, two short answers. Uh, I don't remember, like maybe six marks or something like that. Six, seven marks. For each question, for to, together, together, together. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Are we allowed to have notes in the test? Yes, yes. Okay. For the last time, guys, please have your binders right next to you. Okay. <laughs> but if you haven't studied, having the notes next to you is not going to help. Okay. What I do recommend is again creating a help sheet. Okay, like a one-page, two-page summary sheet of things that you just have trouble memorizing or something, okay? Things that you have trouble understanding, you know, have a reference sheet is okay. What I don't want you to be doing is flipping through the notes and trying to find the answer on the test, right? That's not gonna work. You're not gonna be able to find it. You will run out of time, okay? Is this open book quiz? Okay, so I thought, I, does that answer your question as well, Ivana? Right? Like it's, it's, it's open book in the sense that, yes, you have access to all the notes, okay? It, it's fine. Um, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> don't worry guys look i'm not trying to fail anyone here deliberately okay it's a very reasonable quiz okay if you have if you have watched the lecture if you have come to the lectures if you have done the study guides um you should be you should be in a relatively good position okay it's not it's not it's nothing uh that is ridiculously uh difficult okay like i'm not trying to catch you or something okay just trying to give you things that we talked about. Sure, go ahead. If you, if you need to go, go, okay, we're done for today. But if you have more questions you know, about a quiz or whatever, like, feel free to stay and ask. Yeah, go ahead, Tash. Um, this might be an unreasonable uh, no request. No worries, go ahead, yeah, go, go, go. Um, but uh, so I have a math test start like uh, soon starting at uh, 1230. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I have work right after that, so Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'll have time to complete the test. Like, yeah, so you should start the test now, right? Before your math test, right? Because it start your math test, you said start at 12.30, right? So the, uh, the, the quiz only takes 45 minutes, right? So, you know, you, you can either do it now or, you know, maybe do it after your uh, shift ends, right? I, I don't know okay. if the shift is going to end, yeah. But do try, right. to, try to fit everything in, okay? Okay. All right, anyone else have any burning questions they want to ask? Yep, go ahead. Uh, Dingshira. Okay, thank you. It's uh, Risa 